Okay, well, uh, we are um, ready to begin our next session now, um, moderated by Julius Bird, uh, looking at the role of multi-asset allocation in shifting environments. Uh, Julius will be joined by Ashwan Alanka, Head of Global Asset Allocation, and also by Tihana Ibrahima Pasic, who is a Portfolio Manager with multi-asset as well. I think we're ready to go. Julius, over to you. Thanks very much, Lucy. Uh, as you say, I'm joined by Ash and uh, Tihana here today. Uh, I'll jump straight in. Equities down, bonds down. Uh, that's a fairly strange environment um, for what people have been used to for the last 20, 20 years. Ash, with that in mind, is that the strangest thing for you that's happening in markets at the moment? Um, no, that's not actually the strangest thing that's, that I think that's happening in the market. I think that's quite expected on, given what central banks around the world, at least in the developed, well, both developed and non-developed markets are doing. But what I personally and honestly find quite strange and puzzling, um, and I'll be honest, I, I don't think I have a great answer to this, but, but nevertheless, I'll, I'll share an observation, is the weaker U.S. dollar in an environment where U.S. rates are rising quite sharply, and not just nominal rates rising sharply, but real rates are rising sharply. Um, theory would suggest, hey, the, you're getting extra carry, um, greater interest rate differential um, holding the U.S. dollar. So why, since the beginning of the year, has the U.S. dollar been surprisingly uh, weak? Um, I have some intuitive reasons behind that. Uh, I think what could be playing a role in that weakness, um, which like I said, is surprising given what theory would suggest, is petrodollars. Um, oil supply is tight. There might be uh, just less recirculation um, of petrodollars back into the US. Um, and we all know petrodollars are a big source of funds that support the dollar. Um, it may also be the case that foreign buyers of U.S. Treasuries are taking a step back because they don't want, want to get ahead of the repricing of interest rates and the, 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 the hiking of interest rates. Um, so, so rather than collecting um, higher carry today, um, the, the, they're playing it a bit cautious because they're worried about the, the, the principal, um, um, the, the value of the principal of their bonds decreasing over time. Um, so that, that, that weaker dollar is surprising to me personally. Um, interestingly, what we've also heard from a, a number of clients that we, we've spoken to over the past many weeks is they're surprised why, the, why gold isn't working as a hedge. Um, com commonplace thinking is gold is a great hedge when inflation risk is high. Um, inflation risk is certainly very high, not just here in the U.S., but outside of the U.S. as well. So why is gold not acting as a good hedge? Um, and, and the reason really has to do with gold is not a great hedge of, against inflation unless it's an environment where real rates are falling. Gold is a real asset. Precious metals are real assets. And real assets, the biggest headwind um, to a real asset arises in real rates. And what you've seen unfold year to date is a massive pickup in real rates. And hence, it's not surprising gold just isn't going to work as a great hedge. And that's what you've seen. Um, so I, I, I would be very wary in thinking about using gold to protect against inflation risk in this environment where central banks are tightening and those real rates likely are going to rise, hurting all real assets, such as precious metals. Okay, so weaker dollar. Gold isn't working as a hedge. Tahana, what's uh, striking you as odd out there? Yeah, I think if we um, if we look at what's been happening in the market so far this year, we've obviously seen, as you correctly identified, um, uh, a large sell-off, uh, particularly in the growth oriented stocks. And you know, we all know that Nasdaq has suffered a lot in, at one point, and generally was down uh, around minus fifteen percent. Uh, now it's hovering around minus seven percent level. Um, but given the monetary policy normalization and rate hikes and rate hikes expectations that are now being introduced by the likes of uh, Bank of England, the Fed, and, and even the ECB joining the club, I don't think that such underperformance of the growth style uh, can be put in the context of this um, um, uh, shifting macroeconomic environment. But uh, if you look on the other side, um, you know, where, where, 
where do we see some discrepancies? I would certainly say that some parts of the growth market uh, worldwide have sold off uh, much more than uh, one could reasonably expect, especially given that the local market dynamics. And one such area, for example, would be Japan. In Japan, you have a completely different interest rate dynamic um, uh, compared to the rest of uh, developed markets. Um, so in Japan, unlike in the UK, in the US or Europe, the interest rates are actually not expected to rise and uh, bond yields have moved uh, very little comparatively. So, so to us, it is quite unusual to see such a disproportionate effect on growth uh, names in Japan, for example, given the domestic macroeconomic uh, backdrop, which, which hasn't really changed materially. Um, so if you look at, for example, year to date numbers, uh, the growth part of the market in Japan is down more than the equivalents in the US and Europe. Um, and this move has uh, wiped out uh, half of the gains, for example, uh, made since the beginning of the pandemic. So if you look at back to end of 2019 to date, Japan growth is only up around 10% after this 10% uh, uh, correction in, in uh, January. Uh, and comparing that to US growth um, uh, as a style, um, US names are still up around 60% throughout the same period, even after the January meltdown. So, uh, so we feel that this move is certainly overdone in, in some regions uh, when it comes to growth as a style. And, and you, uh, you touched on it there, Tana, but another perhaps strange thing that's happening in, bar, in, uh, in, in markets, but perhaps not that strange for the older amongst us, but that's a, a rising interest rate environment. How do you think markets are going to um, uh, react to a structurally rising interest rate environment yeah you're right um so i think what we've seen uh, this year is is quite abrupt repricing of, of interest rates in, in developed markets uh so for the us and, and the uk we're now looking at um, over five hikes or more prices to the curve and in, uh, in europe the ecb uh, as i said has joined the party and, and there are several hikes now um uh, on the table so so this elevated volatility that we've seen we're we're likely um, expecting it to continue in the in the months and, and ahead and possibly longer um and so what does that mean to to investors um i think it, it likely means that portfolios that have worked uh previously during the year of uh, very low or ultra low uh interest rates in fact and, and uh, abundant liquidity and and uh, supportive central banks uh, those portfolios may not be suitable uh, going forward. So we would expect a world of lower returns and, and higher volatility. Uh, and uh, against that backdrop, um, there are a couple of uh, couple of themes that, uh, that I think whilst we have to recognize that, that the interest rates are going up uh, and inflation is, is, uh, is, is rising as well across the uh, majority of developed markets, uh, there are certain regions that have different dynamics. And I think particularly from the asset allocation perspective, it's important to acknowledge those differences. So I already touched on Japan um, very briefly um, in, in terms of the, the, the macroeconomic picture there. Um, but in China, you also have a very different monetary policy, which, which, which is loose. It's certainly not being tightened anytime soon. Interest rates are not rising and uh, inflationary pressures are, are not really a feature uh, in that market. So from the asset allocator's perspective, uh, these assets are interesting as they could likely provide differentiated sources of return and, and complement um, other uh, regional exposures. Um, another thing that I would highlight as well is, is the role of fixed income. Uh, we feel that this, this environment of rising rates or gradually rising rates uh, is challenging uh, for fixed income investors. So uh, when it comes to high duration assets like sovereign bonds and, and investment grade credit, uh, we would we would uh, tend to stay uh, underway there and possibly look on a relative basis to to um, uh, favor more uh, high yield or uh, spread types of products. Um, and the final one, um, uh, as in final theme, that uh, would be listed alternatives um, because we feel it's important to stay diversified and also to look at uh, diversified and uncorrelated sources of of return. Great. And Ash, where are you putting money to work in a rising rate environment? Well, I think in a rising rate environment, what you really have to think about, and you kind of uh, touched upon this, is the biggest threat to any portfolio is going to be is going to be the difficulty in finding diversification. Um, what has been absolutely true over the last forty years, the ballast of diversification has been fixed income, um, because yields just have trended lower. Um, this diversification that fixed income offered was also extremely cheap. Um, so you held bonds by holding bonds, they offset equity risk, and you make great money holding bonds. Um, and with this ballast potentially gone over the medium term, 
the, the biggest challenge is going to be finding other sources of diversification um, that aren't overly expensive. Um, so the easy game is likely coming to an end and you have to think about, well, will alternatives help diversify the downside to equities? Um, should I think about buying direct optionality to protect against the downside to equities? So I think that the focus when it comes to building portfolios, and we all hold multi-asset portfolios, is thinking critically about where I can find good sources of diversification against equity risk, because bonds may not play as great of a role um, and provide or do that job as efficiently going forward as it has over the last 40 years. Okay, great. And we've just got a, uh, a few minutes left now, leaving the immediacy of markets behind us. Tana, what do you think the next evolution of multi-asset investing might or will be? Sure, I think from, from our perspective, we would expect a lot of innovation to happen in the sustainable investing space. And we're already seeing uh, a lot of things happening on the scene. So compared to say 10 years ago, for instance, uh, asset management community has now embraced the idea of, of tackling environmental and, and social challenges. And we have a very active role in providing solutions there. Um, and this is where a lot of innovations can come in the multi-asset investing too. Um, so for example, if you, if you think about practical implementation of that, some of the avenues could be structuring products that uh, solve particular problems. So for example, we're already seeing carbon transition portfolios where investors um, allocate capital to businesses with solid uh, carbon transition readiness, uh, which utilize forward-looking uh, carbon reduction um, metrics and, and science-based targets. But we feel that a lot more could be done in, in designing um, adequate methodologies and also uh, more specific goals. Um, Another interesting one um, that, that I can think of would be, for example, thematic multi-asset funds. So there is a lot of representation amongst equity strategies um, when it comes to thematic investing, but possibly not so much in the multi-asset space. Um, so, for example, for particular types and types of investors, we could be designing uh, uh, multi-asset solutions that address sustainable themes like, um, for example, medical technology or education or housing and so on and so forth. Right, Ash? Um, well, in my opinion, multi-asset investing, it's really about portfolio construction. Um, and if you think about it, the only really big um, redefining moment in multi-asset investing um, was the, the coming of risk parity, um, which was in the, the early 80s, where risk parity um, was a way and was designed to build more diversified portfolios, realizing the balanced so-called 60-40 portfolio its risk all came from its equity um, holdings. Um, so building a more diversified portfolio is what risk parity did for you. Um, but both risk parity and that 60-40 did really well over the last 40 years for exactly the same reason. They rode the massive bull market in fixed income. Um, so if, fixed in if that fixed income bull market is behind us, if fixed income is actually the source of risk in the system, if fixed income is not going to be as effective in diversifying your equity exposure, I really do believe the next phase of multi-asset research, which is going to be an exciting phase, is thinking about building portfolios that do not rely as much on the ability of bonds to hedge equity downside. Um, so that, that's going to be an exciting area. I think another exciting area, what we've seen over the last few years is the birth of potentially entirely new asset classes. Um, these asset classes are classes such as cryptocurrencies, um, carbon credits. So thinking about, are, is there a permanent risk premium one can source by holding cryptocurrencies, by holding carbon credits? If the answer is yes, and that source of risk premium also is uncorrelated to your typical bond or fixed income risk premium, a lot of research is going, should be done and warrants to be done to build an ecosystem that thinks about, well, how can we now build optimal strategic portfolios where both cryptocurrencies and carbon credits have a seat at the table? Um, so th th there are a lot of exciting things I think are, that are going to happen over the next couple of years when it comes to the core of multi-asset multi, multi, multi -asset investing, which is 
building better portfolios and thinking about different components that can make that portfolio more robust and more efficient going forward, even if going forward is an environment which is very different from the environment over the last four decades because uh, of what bond, uh, because of the changing behavior uh, of bonds going forward. Great. Ash, thank you very much. Tana, thank you very much. Uh, hand back to you, Lucy. Thank you. Julius, thank you thank so you much. Tahana and Ash, great to hear your thoughts. Thank you thank as you. well.